freaking Killjoys, man. I hate them so much. I don't even need to explain what they are, of course. It literally says in the name. They are moments that kill your joy. Duh. Now, every gamer has their own personal selection of Killjoys, and I am obviously no exception. Anything can qualify as a Killjoy. A level, a mission, a boss fight, etc. As long as they suck the fun out of me, they can go into the list. I am Obsidious fan, and this is my top 10 personal video game Killjoys. Yes, keep in mind that the word personal is on the title. This means the list is entirely based off my own personal experiences. Even if some of these choices may sound weird for you, I will do my best to explain why I hate them so much. Trust me, I've seen some weird choices for Killjoys in the Countdown community. I even saw this guy who chose the Roxas prologue from Kingdom Hearts 2, and it doesn't make any sense because it's at the exact beginning of the game, it can't exactly kill much joy. Hey Chief John Boygan, you know I regret that decision. Besides, at least my version of the topic is a lot better than... Well, you know who's. Thank God it was, and at least both of you knew where to cut the introduction segment and start the countdown. <coughs> Tutorials are the most basic part of a video game. We all know how it goes. The game tells you what to do, you learn it, replicate it and move on. Sounds fairly simple, right? Well, it seems that Trey Parker and Matt Stone didn't get the memo, because the sneaky squeaker tutorial in South Park The Stick of Truth is horrible. I know, it sounds incredibly stupid to consider a tutorial to be a killjoy, but hear me out. During a specific part of the game, Randy Marsh will teach you how to perform this new magic spell, AE Fart, called the Sneaky Squeaker. The name is pretty much self-explanatory. The main problem here is that the tutorial itself barely explains anything. So what will follow are 15 minutes of frustration in which you will try to pull it off, moving the left and right analog sticks in an extremely specific way. If you miss the mark by just one second, you will fail and you have to do it all over again. It also doesn't help that you have to place the fart on the other side of the room and not behind Randy like he tells you to do. And if you fail, you will have to listen to Randy repeat the same line over and over and over and ah! This will go on and on until you look it up online and find out the actual way of passing this freaking tutorial. Yes, in case you thought this was a weird choice, there are tutorials on this tutorial online. Is that poorly designed? Now, the Sneaky Squeaker tutorial is at the bottom of the list because it's a really short segment of the game. Not only that, but now I know exactly how to do it. But it still is a poorly made tutorial that just annoys players instead of teaching them how to play the game. I really hope the South Park duo keeps it together for the Fracture Bad Call, because I really don't want to go through one of these awful tutorials again. I'd rather eat a chili made of my own parents. The Drive Forms were one of my favorite new additions to Kingdom Hearts 2. The idea of using more than one Keyblade at the same time, with different abilities and powers, was genius and incredibly entertaining. It definitely made the combat of this game more unique and fluid, until you stumble upon the Antiform. The Antiform is an excellent idea on paper, it's basically Sora's inner darkness hidden within his heart, and hell, it even looks badass, and maybe even a bit too edgy but the execution leaves a bad taste in my mouth. While it has some flashy combos, they only really work with weaker enemies. For stronger enemies and boss battles, you might as well let yourself get killed, because the anti-form can completely ruin your strategy. While on this form, Sora can't block, use magic, use items or activate reaction commands. If you ever played Kingdom Hearts 2, you know that these options can make the difference of whether losing or winning a difficult fight. This is even worse in the final mix version of the game, which has a lot of new challenging bonus bosses. And the anti-form can ruin your progress if it appears on an inopportune moment where you can't heal yourself or use the boss's reaction command. These lag-based events in video games just never work. Oh, and don't get me started when anti-form ruins your progress during drive form grinding. Grinding is a killjoy in itself, so when you have a killjoy within a killjoy, ugh, it just makes me wanna vomit. However, the anti-form is not any higher because you can prevent it from happening if you use the final form a lot. And yeah, you can do some amazing stuff with it, but that's just if you are really freaking good at the game. 
Normal players will just have to stick to rage quitting every time the anti-form pops up. Like old man Xehanort would say, I blame the power of... Darkness! 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 I am sick of the boss rush trope in gaming. Oh, it can be done right if it's an extra mode, or if it's related to the story while presenting new material, but when a boss rush is just a cheap and lazy way to make a game longer while reusing all the previous bosses, I just get mad. And the worst offenders of this are Capcom games, specifically Devil May Cry 3 and Okami. Indeed, number 8 is a tie between two poorly made boss rushes from two different Capcom games, but they both suck because of different reasons. Let me explain. Mission 18 of Devil May Cry 3 takes place in the world of the demons, which actually has a creative design to it, only to be ruined by the inevitable boss rush. The problem here is that most of the bosses in Devil May Cry 3, while very entertaining, are also extremely challenging. Defeating them takes a lot of time and effort. While it may not be too hard to defeat the first two or three, by the time you get to the next one, you will just be exhausted, and you will want to just move on. In most cases, you will have to do like me and go back to previous missions to grind for health upgrades. And we all know that grinding is as fun as watching a video about natural childbirth. And yes, I know that technically you are not forced to fight all the bosses, but the lazy design is still there. Hey, just fighting a few of DMC3's hard bosses in a row is already painful enough. On the other hand, the arc of Yamato from Okami is just plain tedious. The bosses in Okami are not hard, but they are very long. While facing them at the end of a long level may be satisfying, here it just feels like a chore. Especially considering that this is the third time that you are fighting Orochi. Third time! What the fuck? How lazy is that? And hell, the arc of Yamato doesn't even include Slechku and Nechku, the best bosses in the game, so it's not even a well-made boss rush, what the fuck? So, to conclude, a boss rush of painfully hard bosses and a boss rush of tediously long bosses. These Capcom boss rushes are not too high on the list because there is some fun to be had here, and they are even followed by a kick-ass final level and an amazing final boss respectively, but they still feel like pointless, tedious and lazy ways of padding out the game's length. Capcom, please, I love you. Okay, not really, but please hear me out. If you ever make a Devil May Cry 5 or a Kami 3, don't include any boss rush in them. How about actually making creative final levels for a change, eh? Oh, and while you're at it, if you could also pretend to give a shit about Mega Man, that would be just swell. What I am talking about, I don't care for Mega Man that much, just make Devil May Cry 5, damn it! I am all in for multiple playable characters in games, the more different they are the better, but playing as Shinobu in No More Heroes 2 is one of the worst examples on how to do it. I may actually like Shinobu as a character, but let's be honest here, she plays like absolute shit. She's fast with that katana of hers, and her combat can occasionally be fun, but it all goes downhill when you realize that she has to taunt after every single combo she makes. What was the point of this? The only thing that this annoying town does is make Shinobu extremely vulnerable to enemy attacks. I appreciate to try to change the gameplay by making Shinobu different from Travis, I really do, but this is just a poorly made mechanic. And to make matters even worse, Shinobu also has the ability to jump, which sounds good on paper. I mean, I always thought that preventing Travis touchdown from jumping was very stupid, but when you jump with Shinobu, you can easily see why he doesn't do it. Shinobu's jumping is stiff, clunky and hard to control. This translates to some uncomfortable and downright frustrating platforming sections. And if you fall, oh excuse me, when you fall, you will have to do it all over again. It's just not fun at all. What's ironic is that there's actually a third playable character in No More Heroes 2, Henry, and he managed to be very fun to play as, while also being different enough from Travis. So, why the hell was he playable from just one boss fight, while we had to go through two awful levels as Shinobu? And to wrap it all up, Shinobu has to fight two of the worst bosses in the entire series. Million Gun Man and New Destroy Man, who not only suck by themselves, but Shinobu's gameplay makes it all even more annoying and frustrating. 
but at the end of the day, there is at least one redeeming quality to Shinobu's levels. She may have the best save screen I've seen in any game. Metal Gear is no stranger to torture and interactive cutscenes. Usually, they are not exactly entertaining, but a very interesting challenge that affects the story in some way or another. There was one in the original game, there was another one in Snake either, but the torture scene in Peace Walker is broken beyond belief and a major killjoy to me. I know, having an interactive cutscene on this list sounds very dumb, but I am sure you will hate this torture part as much as I do if you ever play Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. During this part of the game, Dr. Strangelove will kidnap Big Boss and proceed to torture him with electricity in order to make him talk about the boss's defection. To survive the electrocution and pass this part of the game, you will have to rapidly press the triangle button over and over. The first time is annoying but not too bad. The second time is painful to my fingers, and the third one is downright impossible, and it makes me physically exhausted. Now look at my chubby fingers, I don't actually have the physique to mash the button as much as Peace Walker wants me to. I tried, I tried so hard but I just couldn't do it. I actually had to call my friend Fran to come over and do it for me. If it wasn't for him, I would have never been able to pass this part of the game. That is definitely a killjoy. And it's just ridiculous. People are going to call me fat in the comments, aren't they? If you are going to implement button mashing in your game, you have to make sure it's simple enough for any gamer. Just press a button multiple times and you're done. So I can't really understand why some games like Peace Walker decide for their button mashing sequences to be almost impossible, to the point it can actually hurt the gamer's hands. When you're relying on the gamer's physical skills to proceed with your game, it's a sign that you're doing something wrong. At the end of the day, you don't feel that the torture is the electrocution itself, but it actually is the frustrating button machine that you're trying to beat, am I right? <laughs> I've always found Sonic Heroes to be a rather underappreciated game. Well, at least outside of Sonic's disturbing fanbase. I think that most people don't give credit to some of the more unique ideas of this game, like the three-way team gameplay or the really cool levels, all with very interesting designs and concepts. But having a creative idea for a level doesn't mean that automatically it's going to be good. Case in point, Casino Park Zone, specifically the pinball sections. This is a casino level. Great idea, but nothing really new as far as Sonic levels go. But with the inclusion of team gameplay and, you know, Sonic Heroes being in 3D, they could have actually done something great with it, right? Hahaha, <laughs> no! They instead decided to include the most obnoxious pinball minigame ever in a video game. There are several times during Casino Park Zone in which your team will be used as the ball of a pinball minigame. And I loathe these segments with passion. What could actually be a fun variation to the level ends up being a very annoying game of where the fuck am I going, in which you will have to try to get out of there as quick as possible. You have little to no control of where your ball is going on this complicated maze, and you will want to slam your controller against the screen after 10 minutes of frustrating attempts. These pinball sections slow down the fast-paced gameplay of a freaking Sonic game, and it just kills any type of fun you may be having during the rest of the level. Oh, and you have to do it like three times, so try not to feel too relieved when you manage to get out of it the first time. I want to love Sonic Heroes, I really do, but I just can't love a game that forces me to go through the same levels four times with four different teams that play almost the same. And Casino Park Zone is the main reason why. The idea of playing through this awful level four times by itself is enough to not make me want to touch Sonic Heroes ever again. I knew people usually get screwed over at casinos, but not like this, man. Not like this! In 
India always seemed like an amazing country to me, so it should make up for a very interesting setting in a video game level, right? Well, this is true for Episode 2 of Sly 2 Band of Thieves, but that's not such case for Episode 3, The Predator Awakes. I adore the concept of the Sly Cooper series, going around the world looking for different thieves and or villains, but this entire episode is just not very interesting at all. Let's start with the fact that you are not in a colorful and famous city like previous levels, no, you are just in some random genetic jungle with almost no color in it. Not only the concept is just dull and boring as hell, but the overworld itself is just awful. The jungle is dark so you can barely see where you are going, and the design is so confusing and repetitive that it actually hinders the platforming, making it hard to go from one place to another in order to start a new mission. And what's even worse is that the actual missions themselves aren't anything special either, carrying a bug with a time limit, racing against Nila, an escort mission with a goddamn ruby, and boring turret segments make up a collection of some of the worst missions in the game, let alone the entire series, as they are all boring, annoying, lazy, or all these flaws altogether. And the worst part is that there are so many missions! Episode 3 of Slide 2 drags on for so freaking long! It overstays it welcome so much that you will wish you could magically pass this episode without actually going through it, I know I did, since I didn't touch Slide 2 for at least a month when I was stuck in this boring and confusing jungle. Yeah, it may have a very cool boss fight at the end, but it doesn't keep the entire episode to be on this list for being just so awful. I swear that if I ever go to an Indian jungle like this one, I would set it on fire! To all my Indian viewers, if I even have those, don't take that as an actual threat. I am sure your jungles are as beautiful as I imagined them. But if I ever end up doing it, blame this game. A slide 2 is guilty of the future destruction of your jungle. Beware. I have a love-hate relationship with Jack 2. While it's not a bad game by any means, it still has some of the most tedious and challenging missions I've ever seen in a game. It can really kick your ass if it wants to. A lot of the missions in Jack 2 are possible killjoys that could have easily been on here. There's the class races, escorting cruisemen down the sewers, the underwater levels with the mech, the drill platform missions, and even the freaking final boss. Ach! Sorry, sorry. The mere mention of these awful missions is enough to make me sick. It was hard to choose just one of them, but I finally went for the mission that killed the most amount of joy and made me not want to touch this game for longer, getting the seal piece from the water slams. <laughs> I know, I hate this mission so much, I don't even want to talk about it. <sighs> but I have to do it. The show must go on, as they say, if you can even call this a show. Anyways, this putrid excuse for a mission is fairly simple. Shaq and Daxter will have to get a seal piece for the Seal of Mar on the water slams of Haven City. Problem is, once they get their hands on it, it turns out to be a trap from the Crimson Guards who will proceed to try to catch the duo. And oh boy, they are extremely persistent. You will have to escape from the docks while defeating every Crimson Guard you find, but there are way too much of them and they take a lot of hits to kill. And you know what? Shaq's health only takes 4 hits, so it won't take too long for the guards to trap you and kill you almost instantly. The worst part is that this game's checkpoint placement is so unfair, so if you're really close to succeeding but you die, you will have to start all over again. How fucking cheap is that? I don't want to do this horrible mission over and over. Why Shaq 2? Why? <laughs> and don't even try to escape through the water. There's a robot that will kill you with one shot down there. This mission was designed in a way where you can't cheat and easily breeze through it. You will have to be extremely patient and think carefully of what you are doing in order to escape from the guards. The Water Slam Seal Piece mission in Jack 2 is hell. The huge amounts of guards trying to get you will make it impossible for you to take a fucking step without receiving a single hit and the cheap checkpoint placement of the game makes it even more tedious. Thank god that Jack 3 is such a fantastic game or else I don't think I would love this franchise as much as I do.
Number two is Celosia from Shadow of the Colossus. What a surprise! That was sarcasm, by the way. Of course, one of my most hated boss battle in gaming had to be on here. I already talked about how much I hate Celosia many times in other videos. It's no surprise that such a poorly made boss also managed to be one of my personal killjoys. When I first got my hands on Shadow of the Colossus, I enjoyed it so much. I tried to defeat a Colossus per day and move on to the next one the day after. It didn't matter how hard they were or if it took me many hours, I didn't turn off my console until at least one more Colossus was down. Until Silosia completely broke my pattern. Not only he has a stupid design and a pathetic way of being defeated, with Wonder having to scare it away with fire. Yes, a scare with fire. A freaking Colossus! Ugh, it's just as dumb as it sounds. But the real issue comes once you destroy Silosia's armor. He will constantly charge at you, over and over and over and over, and every single time he uses this charge attack against you, it will take Wonder at least 30 seconds to wake up. And once he wakes up, you won't be able to take a single step until Silosia attacks you again. Keep it together, Wonder, for fuck's sake! And in the unlikely case you manage to get on his back where Celosia's weak point is, it won't be very easy to stop him as it was with the other Colossi. He will move so much that you will barely manage to do some damage before you fall from his back and go back to the beginning. What else can I say about Celosia? I already talked about how much I hate him many times. In a game filled with epic, challenging, entertaining boss fights, he's just an exception. Celosia is a combination of laziness, frustration, cheapness, and tediousness in one of the worst boss experiences I've ever faced. But as awful as it sounds, there's still one killjoy that managed to trigger me even more. My number one choice is a classic killjoy for a lot of people. It's a level so annoying, so obnoxious and so tedious that mentioning its name is enough to make some people groan, including myself. I am talking, of course, about a certain Water Dungeon from the Legend of Zelda series. Make a stupid build up to trick people into thinking that the number one is the Water Temple when it's actually the Temple of the Ocean King from the Phantom Hourglass. Check. I'd say I succeeded. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't know how many people play the Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass, but anybody who did so would tell you how awful the Temple of the Ocean King is. And I am here to explain why, as it is my number one killjoy in gaming. Anybody who has played a Zelda game knows how confusing the dungeons can be. They have different patterns, enemies and puzzles. They always need some time to think of what to do and how to do it. It's part of the charm of the franchise. But in the Temple of the Ocean King, you have a time limit and it depletes very fast. This is because of the Phantom Hourglass from the title itself. Without this MacGuffin, and once it runs out of sand, Link's health will be depleted almost automatically, and if you die, it's all over from the beginning. Having a time limit in any game is always tedious to me, as I feel it hinders progress and annihilates any time I could use to think. Having a time limit in a Zelda dungeon is just the worst thing, as I feel like I am always in a rush and I almost never can take a moment to breathe and let everything sink in, it's a very obnoxious feeling. Yes, there are safe zones in this dungeon in which you can relax and take a break for a while, but they are very few and separated from each other, so you won't be able to feel relaxed for much long. All of these issues already make the Temple of the Ocean King an annoying experience that gets easily into my nerves. But what made it my number one killjoy in gaming is the implementation of the Phantom. No, not that Phantom! Who the hell is editing this? Oh wait! That would be me. Are <laughs> you? The Phantoms are the guardians of this temple. Their objective is to catch Link and attack him. And every time they hit you, you will lose a lot of time in your hourglass. And this dungeon is filled with Phantoms, making the tedious task of getting through it even harder and more frustrating. Oh, and they even have their own minions, the Phantom Eyes, who will alert them if they see you. Your only way of escaping is going to the aforementioned safe zones, but don't expect it to be very easy since the temple is full of different types of phantoms and phantom eyes. It all ends up being a game of cat and mouse that doesn't feel like a satisfying challenge, it's just annoying as all hell. 
If all of this already sounded very bad, let me remind you, the Temple of the Ocean King is a recurring dungeon. This means that Link will actually go through it five times. Five different freaking times! Every time you will be having a lot of fun with the rest of the game, all fun will be sucked out by the mere sight of this horrible recurring level. I hate it so much. I've heard stories of people who didn't want to finish the game because of this temple. I even heard of some people who destroyed their copy because of how tedious, repetitive, annoying and poorly made the Temple of the Ocean King is. And to be honest, sometimes I wish I could destroy the temple itself. <sighs> if this isn't the definition of a killjoy, I don't know what is. And yet, this was the first Zelda game I've ever played. I played through the Temple of the Ocean King as many times as I needed, and I fell in love with this amazing franchise, even with a gigantic Killjoy as this one. I guess it goes to show that, as much as we hate Killjoys, we can't let them ruin the overall experience of a video game. But seriously, FUCK THE TEMPLE OF THE OCEAN KING! And that was my list of my top 10 personal Killjoys in video games. It's been a while since I made a negative countdown, so I would love to hear what you guys thought about it. And you can even tell me about some of your personal killjoys too. Like always, feel free to leave any comments down below, it's always appreciated. And also feel free to subscribe, click there to watch some of my other countdowns, right there to watch some of my reviews, or there to check out my brand new series, The Boss Inspection. I think you're going to like it. I don't really have much to say here today, so... Thanks a lot for watching, I am Obsidious Fan and I'll see you guys next time! Oh boy, do I overuse that phrase or what?